Thanks very much. So I want to preface this by saying these are incredibly preliminary results. Um, I only saw the results of the scans about a week ago, uh, and we wouldn't even have this if it wasn't for my co-authors, Toy McCoy and Melanie Hopkins, uh, who burnt the end of their various semesters um, getting uh, these results for me to then try to interpret. Um, and before I go into any details, uh, I want to thank uh, the Pentological Association um, that provided uh, funds to, to scan this animal, uh, and Jason Dunlop for bringing the specimen to my attention and discussing uh, it with me, and Neil Clark and the Hunterian uh, for providing access to the material. Uh, and then finally, the American Museum of Natural History, um, whose CT scanner did the magic for us. Uh, and so, as I'm sure I've bored most of you uh, sometime in the past with, uh, Eurypterids are a very... Uh, interesting group of Paleozoic aquatic arthropods. Um, they have uh, moderate diversity. Um, they are known from about 250 species. Um, and we have a pretty well-resolved phylogeny for them now. We've got uh, a, a fairly stable idea of how these things are related. Uh, and so what this lets us do now is to look at um, broader trends uh, in their evolutionary history and to see uh, how they've interacted with either other organisms or uh, changes in their environment. Of course, it's well, all well and good doing this based off of phylogeny, but what we don't want to lose track of here is the reality of what these things are actually doing and how they're living. Um, and so that's why today I'm putting on my comparative uh, anatomy hat uh, and talking about the morphology of these things and uh, a bit about how we think they are living. Now, luckily for us, Eurypterids are one of the best-known uh, Paleozoic arthropods in terms of their external anatomy. We've got a pretty good idea of their limb structure and the armature, which is fantastic. It gives us an idea of how uh, they'd potentially be able to capture prey and manipulate it. Uh, we have a fairly good idea of um, the uh, entire external exoskeleton, really, including minute details of the um, uh, cuticle um, and... Uh, people are already uh, looking at what this could tell us about their modes of life. And so uh, work by uh, Ross Anderson and Tori McCoy over a number of papers has looked at the uh, visual structures, the visual systems of some of these species, uh, and sort of looked at the visual acuity and tried to work out um, how vociferous these things would have been as predators or otherwise. Um, but one of the big problems we kind of have is that the majority of these things we know have been completely steamrolled. Um, we have some exceptionally preserved cuticle. This is uh, some of Holmes' stuff from Estonia. Um, but it's all completely uh, two-dimensional. Uh, you can macerate it off of the rock and, and look at it in very fine detail. Uh, but it can be very difficult uh, to reconstruct these in 3D. Uh, and my PhD advisor, Paul Selden, actually managed to do exactly that uh, in the early 80s, looking at the uh, prosomal and limb structures uh, of this stuff. And uh, for all intents and purposes, he seemed to have been uh, completely accurate when he managed to do that. Um, but even when we look at things from the lateral view, you can see here, um, we are dealing with what is essentially uh, a pancaked side view of a eurypterid. Uh, and so for looking at some of these details, uh, particularly details like uh, the respiratory structures, which is what I'm currently interested in, um, it, it's a bit difficult. And the reason I'm interested in the respiratory structures is because that can tell us a lot about how these things functioned as animals, um, whether or not they might have been active predators or not. Uh, and previous work has been done using this same uh, Estonian material to look at the respiratory structures in the abdominal uh, plates of Eurypterids. Uh, and Leonard Wills in the 60s uh, reconstructed uh, the opercular, these flattened plates of these animals, uh, and recognized uh, these stippled areas, which are called chymon platen. Uh, and these were considered for quite a while to be the primary respiratory structures of Eurypterids. Um, uh, moving on into the 90s and onwards, we began to find uh, more exceptionally preserved stuff. These are now what we know chymon platen to look like. These are all uh, either micro um, uh, silicious material or SEMs of it. Uh, and they seem to be these um, very porous structures that hung down from the top or uh, the underside of the animal. Um, but we also, uh, Manning and Dunlop described these things, which are interpreted as lamellate book gills. And book gills are how uh, horseshoe crabs uh, respire. Uh, and so it's thought that maybe uh, Eurypterids had these book gills with these ancillary chymoplatin. Uh, and then uh, Manning and Dunlop also described uh, a relatively intact Carboniferous Eurypterid uh, with what they interpreted to be uh, gills in place. And so based off this, with the ancillary chymoplatin material, uh, they reconstructed the respiratory organs of Eurypterids essentially as being uh, like uh, uh, horseshoe crab 
respiration plus with these ancillary chymal platen coming down. And this is all well and good until um, exceptionally preserved material of uh, Onycopterella uh, from the Ordovician soon shell was described. Uh, and this was interpreted as having uh, lamellate uh, respiratory organs, but instead of being horizontally layered, like in horseshoe crabs, they were interpreted as being vertically layered. Uh, and this is interesting because this is perhaps more like the book lungs of arachnids. Uh, of course, in order to um, interpret this, they had to explain uh, the uh, carboniferous material that Manning and Dunlop had, and what they suggested was that essentially uh, what we thought were gills in this other Euryptid were basically just some sort of taphonomic um, oddity. And they explained it away like that. Uh, and the reason that this is important is because we actually have, uh, as you heard earlier, uh, book lungs in a variety of arachnid groups. Uh, and so um, arachnid phylogeny is, uh, well, as you saw in his, this talk has been sort of a bone of contention for a while, although it seems like we're slowly uh, getting towards consensus, which is pretty exciting. Uh, but for a long time, there were debates about whether or not these book lungs are homologous to book gills positionally. That's kind of resolved now, largely because we have this weird critter, Dipsterium. Um, but then whether or not these book gills are directly uh, sort of um, analogous or, or homologous to the book lungs, and this is largely to do with the orientation of them. Uh, and so these are your horseshoe crab book gills. Uh, you can see they're running along the top of this uh, abdominal appendage, and they're all uh, horizontally layered. These are the book lungs of a scorpion. They're much smaller. They're attached to the underside of the body. Uh, and so they seem to be suturing directly onto the body wall. And you can see that these things seem to be more or less um, uh, vertical in the orientation. Um, but, but when you look at them from the side view, they do look kind of horizontal. And so my interpretation of this, and I might be wrong, is that these are basically in the same place, but instead of attaching across the front end, they're attaching from the side. And so when they sort of foliate out, they go this way rather than that way. Um, but I might be completely wrong about that, but that's my interpretation of what's going on here. And you can see in the other uh, arachnids, this book lung structure is fairly conserved. And so what I wanted to do was go back and really look at what's happening in the Eurypterids. And to do this, I went back to the 3D specimen that Manning and Dunlop had. And it turns out that this thing is a Delphalmus, which is a um, carboniferous Eurypterid. You've got a 9 out of 10 chance if you find Eurypterid, Eurypterid in the Carboniferous of finding a Delphalmus. Um, and this is the specimen. Uh, it is uh, phosphatically preserved in this nodule. Um, and you can see here, these are the structures that were interpreted as the book gills originally. Um, it's split in two. You can see it's quite well three-dimensionally preserved. You can see all the limbs under here. And so we CT scanned it. We first CT scanned it. We didn't really know what we were doing. We got something that looked very much like a potato come out. Um, so uh, Melanie uh, very graciously decided to uh, help us with this and scan it again. Uh, we haven't segmented the entire thing yet. That turns out takes a lifetime. Um, but I do have uh, just some cross sections of the scan. And so this is coming in from the top down. Uh, this is a 200 megabyte GIF. These are the limbs, which is really exciting. We have these limbs three dimensionally preserved in the head. Um, and then you can see the body coming through, and we have the abdominal plates, and then you can just about see here some of the gill uh, lamellae. Um, and we sort of track up the body. This thing is doing its best thing to be a gastropod. The body is really badly twisted inside this nodule. Um, and so you go out to the other side, um, and then you're done. Uh, and then coming in from the lateral view, you can see again these limbs heavily splayed out to the side. Uh, that is the swimming paddle. Uh, and then we start getting into the body. You can see there's the prosoma. Uh, and then we've got the epistosoma, the thorax, the, uh, coming through here. And then you can start to see uh, various aspects of the gill lamellae down here. And here are some very wonderfully preserved things at the back. And then the body kinks. And then you have this more three-dimensional uh, post-abnormal unit. Uh, and I'm going to save you the two-minute crawl going lengthwise through this thing because it doesn't tell you much more. Um, but you can see that this thing is quite well preserved three-dimensionally. And while most of the interior is a void fill, we do have aspects, uh, including the respiratory structures, uh, preserved. Uh, and so this is just a side view. And so you can see here, uh, there are some gill lamellae at the back here. Um, but up the front in these anterior sections, there are way more jammed in per segment. And so this is the segment, unfortunately, we've been focusing on. It seems to be slightly unusual compared to the rest. And I think what want you to bear that in mind uh, when looking at this. Uh, and this is just a cross-section through. Here are some more of these gill lamellae. This is the uh, uh, operculum, and there's this sort of void space, and then this is the main body of the animal here. And here it is looking down from the top. You can again see uh, these operculum. 
Uh, and then this is just showing you um, the actual opercula, uh, and you can see the ornamentation on them uh, on the underside. So this is our attempt at reconstructing the gills. This is only one half of uh, the posterior most operculum. Uh, so this is the outer edge. This is the medial part in the middle. And what we have is one set of book gills. Uh, and you can see that we have a number of lamellae under, uh, above this uh, main operculum. Uh, this pink bit here is the sternite, which is the ventral body wall. Uh, and so these things um, are coming down uh, from the top, potentially, uh, these might be attaching directly onto the body wall rather than onto the operculum, which would mean that they seem to share uh, some uh, degree of similarity with uh, those of arachnids. But the, the orientation is clearly more or less horizontal um, as w we get in the horseshoe crabs. Um, but there are only four or five lamellae here, which is really unusual. Um, and so what we want to do is go through and start looking at these ones um, more anteriorly in the animal. Um, but what we can do is sort of um, make a few basic um, observations and then maybe try to suggest why we have so few lamellae at the back here. Uh, first of all, this uh, Carboniferous thalamus definitely has horizontally oriented uh, book gills, uh, much like in horseshoe crabs. Um, the reason why maybe we have fewer lamellae at the back here, uh, it might be something similar to, what, to uh, what's going on in these early instars of Limulus. Uh, they grow uh, with very few lamellae in the book gills and then they just add more. And so this could potentially be a pedomorphic trait um, where at the back here, um, these just haven't developed as much, but we're pretty sure this is an adult individual. The other option is maybe we've got some sort of artifactual clumping um, going on. Uh, luckily, we have uh, Ophicolus and Dipsterium, which are uh, other chalicerates that have been uh, imaged in a similar fashion. Uh, you can see here the gills of, of Dipsterium uh, in the reconstruction. Uh, they sort of all clump together. And so uh, these have been uh, estimated to have about 30 to 40 lamellae in them each, uh, based off the thickness, which is kind of what you'd expect from uh, a book gill or a book lung. Um, Ophicolus has fewer, it has maybe four to five of similar uh, overall size and thickness, actually quite like what we're finding uh, in the back end of adult thalamus. Uh, and so we're ne really not quite sure yet whether uh, what we've got happening here is an artifact of, of preservation or if there are just fewer uh, lamellae in the back of this animal, but we want to compare to the front to, uh, to be sure. Um, what's happening in uh, Onycopterella here? Well, there are a couple of possibilities. Uh, one is that the structures running down the side here aren't actually the respiratory organs at all. They could be muscle tissue. Uh, in scorpions, you have this ventral longitudinal muscle that run, runs along the outside of the body next to the respiratory organs. Uh, and in horseshoe crabs, you can see these uh, very robust muscles coming down into the opercula. So it's possible that that's what, uh, what they have there. Uh, the other option is that maybe it's just an artifact of the way the animal's being viewed. Uh, this is Tachypleus Syriacus. It's a, a horseshoe crab from the Cretaceous of Lebanon. Uh, and these are very clearly standard limulus type book gills. But if you were to look at it just here, you might think that these were vertically rather than horizontally uh, oriented. Uh, and this part of the animal here, when I originally described this, I interpreted this as muscle tissue. Now, I actually don't think that's the case. I think these are very badly preserved book gills. Um, and we're just seeing the lateral edges. And so this appears to be uh, sort of vertical rather than horizontal. Um, and then going back very, very quickly to, to our reconstruction, I've almost convinced myself um, that uh, on the edges of the um, uh, opercula, the, uh, it sort of curves up with the body wall, and this is pushing uh, these gills up as well. And so if we were to catch the end here, these may appear more vertical uh, than horizontal. And so that's what we think might be going on there. Very yep. So to conclude, um, we have uh, a 3D eurypterid uh, in phosphatic nodular preservation. We've micro CT scanned it. We've found internal structures that include the book gills. Um, the book gills are of a similar morphology to those in Zephyrurans. Uh, however, at least the one we've looked at has fewer lamellae than in Zephyrurans and arachnids. And this may potentially suggest actually an increased role of the ancillary chimen platen uh, in respiration in aquatic environments. Chimen platen were uh, originally envisaged as being uh, something to allow them to walk about on land, but I strongly suspect that eurypterids maybe are not as aquatic as some people suggested. So maybe um, we have this dual respiratory system that is sort of working in concert. Uh, thank you.